<laughs> well, Hari, he got all cash on us, so we said, geez, you can't sit up on a panel. Um, so I think this is going to be a really great discussion. We've heard the voices of tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of people throughout the Arab world um, through social media crying out for uh, freedom, new government, um, unfiltered in many ways by other voices, by the press, and by, uh, and so we're finally starting to hear voices. We've seen in places like Haiti, the Haitian diaspora activated so that um, tweets and text messages can be translated, put onto maps so that people can figure out where people are buried, where water supplies are, where clinics are, um, to really mobilize action. We even see in parts of Kenya, um, truckers who can identify uh, corrupt um, checkpoints along the roads and offer alternative routes through the power of social media. So there's real potential here. And we have a wonderful panel to talk about not only the potential of social media and in, in what we've seen and where it might be going, but also some of the challenges and pitfalls of it. And so we're going to have a kind of nice session. We had a great breakfast. Um, I hope we have the same energy we had at breakfast. Um, I'm not going to introduce the panelists. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but I think we're going to start with Ken. Oh, are we? Oh, no, we're going to start with you. We're going to start with me. Either way. Yeah, Charles. Let's start with Please, Charles. I'm happy to jump in. I don't, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder. So my name is Charles Porch. I work on the consumer marketing team at Facebook. Um, and in my role there, I manage relationships with nonprofits, NGOs, cause-based organizations, social movements, um, and the like. Uh, and we're... we're we had an amazing breakfast, and we got a lot to talk about. Which we should have filmed it. We should have filmed it. Um, but um, I, I, I come bearing good news in that there are a lot of really amazing things happening with the environmental movement um, on Facebook. There are groups like NRDC, the Sierra Club, the Nature Conservancy um, that have a really, really great presence. Um, at the same time, I think we have a long way to go um, before you know we reach uh, a movement a la Egypt or you know something of the like. And I think there are a lot of interesting, um, we have a lot of interesting things to discuss um, within that. I'm mean, also especially excited, because I think some of us on this panel would, would, would agree, I'm not actually an expert in the environment and, the, and, and what's going on in the space, but I am an expert in how people are using social media to affect change and to get people engaged, which is actually why I'm really interested to be here, because I'm interested in hearing your perspective um, in terms of what's going on in the space and how we can help amplify that and make it really effective. Great. Thanks. Courtney? Um, hello. Uh, so I'm Courtney Height. I am the co-director of the Energy Action Coalition. Um, and we're a coalition of 50, almost 50 youth-led um, social justice and environmental organizations um, in the States and in Canada. Um, and we just organized uh, 10,000 young people to come to D.C. Um, for a power shift, which uh, was pretty incredible, and mostly climate activists. But um, also we, we work, our, our network is not just environmental folks. We have uh, folks that work on higher ed access, um, LGBT issues as well. Um, and I think the online tools are, are very much something that we are working to embrace more. And I think you know, our generation, uh, the millennial generation, is the largest, most diverse, and also most connected generation uh, in U.S. history. Um, and so we're still fine-tuning the best ways to utilize these tools, you know, Twitter, Facebook, book, uh, emails, our website, um, and I think what we're really looking at is layering that in with our grassroots on the ground organizing, because I think that's, that's definitely so critical to what we're doing. Um, and then a little bit about me, so I, I actually uh, come from student organizing about 15 years of it, actually, since high school, which is a little crazy, um, and so that's kind of my expertise is, is mobilizing young people, um, and I think you know, our biggest challenge is yeah, figuring out the best way to, to utilize all these tools that are at hand. Um, so. Great. Fifteen years ago in high school, I'm feeling old. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, Ken? Yeah, good morning. Um, so, my name's Ken Banks. I'm the founder of Qanja.net and a developer of some software called Frontline SMS, which is probably why I'm here. Uh, my background, very briefly, is about 25 years in IT. I've uh, been living and working in a number of African countries since 1993, running um, conservation projects, ran a primate sanctuary in Nigeria for a year, did some biodiversity survey work in Uganda, Strong passion for conservation, did a lot of work at Gerald Durrell Zoo in Jersey, 
uh, on the computers, which was great for me. Uh, my degree of social anthropology was development studies. And I combine all those things to kind of make the perfect job for me, I guess, which is to really try and figure out how we apply and use new technologies, mostly mobile phones, because that's the one that's the big device out there for most people in most organizations, to create positive social and environmental change. So it's not about ordering pizzas or getting football scores. It's about delivering critical information and getting information back. It's a two-way thing. Um, a couple of very initial points from me um, about this is that bear in mind, I think, that social media is very new. And I, I get sort of quite wary of social media experts. Um, it's almost too new to have. You know, there, are, there are experts Offended, offended. No. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're an expert in Facebook, but maybe not. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, people are still learning on their feet, right? There are, there's, there's good practices out there. There are things you can learn from. But there's a lot that people are still trying to figure out. So there's no, I would say, definitive guide yet. You, you learn by doing, basically. Um, I think also the interesting thing uh, here is that uh, it's frustrating for me, and we had a little discussion about this, about you know, how conservation and the environmental movement has been a little bit slower than other sectors. But I think it's important that we can actually get out of our silos and we can look at other uses of social media in other areas, the Arab Spring, revolutions in North Africa, uh, the use of mobile phones and social media in health and other areas. And we can learn from those things. It's a general tendency, I think, in our world to put ourselves in little boxes. Health people speak to health people. Agriculturalists speak to agriculturalists. But there's actually a lot of cross-fertilization that you can really pick up on and learn from from that. Um, the big bit about our work is actually trying to get communication going in places where there is no internet and is no social media. I think we have to bear in mind that if you run social media campaigns and you reach out through social media, that actually more people are not on social media on the planet than are. So it's very important to remember that. I sometimes think that everybody's on Twitter and that everything's happening on Twitter. And if I tweet something that's not picked up, I get a bit disappointed, but then I have to do a reality check and realize that you know, maybe only 10% of my audience actually are on Twitter, and I have to think about other ways of creatively reaching out to the other 90%. So social media is part of a wider strategy. It's not the one tool to be used that replaces everything else. The answer actually to your, to your problem might be a crayon, right? You know, so let's just you know, make sure the technology is put right at the end of your decision tree and think about what it is you're trying to achieve uh, before you do anything. And I think a final point, without taking up too much at the beginning, um, there's a general feeling that uh, there's a thing called slacktivism. I don't know how many people here have, have heard of slacktivism. People pressing a like button on a Facebook page or following somebody on Twitter or retweeting something is an expression or indication they support that. But it doesn't necessarily actually lead to anything. Uh, I was at a conference in Oxford about two months ago, and a lady there made a huge point that during the Arab Spring uprising, it wasn't the people turning their Facebook icons or whatever green to show support for Iran. It wasn't people liking pages and sitting in front of screens. It was people getting out on the street. So we have to sort of realize that social media can engage people, but if they're only sitting at their screens and not actually doing anything beyond that, is that actually a result or an impact that we want to have? So I think slacktivism, turning slacktivism into activism is actually a very, very good way of thinking about how we, how we convert one to the other. I've got a few other things, but I'll, I'll leave it at that and uh, pass it back to Ned. Thanks, Ned. Uh, my name is Bill Powers, and um, like Charles, I was a little bit insecure about being invited to this because I'm not an environmental expert at all. Um, but I do have a book out that's about technology and social media. It's called Hamlet's Blackberry. And the subtitle says that it's a practical philosophy for building a good life in the digital age, which is a, a mouthful, but that is what the book is basically about. It's throwing out some ideas at this early stage, as Ken suggests, in the digital age, when we're really still learning these tools and trying to make the best use of them and trying to build a new world, a better world with them, throwing out some ideas about how to use them wisely. I went into the book uh, as a project concerned that we, in our enthusiasm for all the amazing potential of these tools, that we were going overboard, in this culture anyway, where so many of us are connected, with the time and the energy and the addiction, in some cases, that we are dedicating to the screen and turning away from other ways of organizing, other ways of getting together with each other, other ways of experiencing and learning from the world, including the environment. You know, Americans are now spending, on average, over eight hours a day at screens, facing screens. That's Americans of all ages, from kids on up. That is a lot of time facing a screen, and we have an amazing amount to learn from the screen, and we're doing wonderful work on the screens, as this panel suggests. But I do think that we're at a moment when 
it's time to get really smart about the tools and to make sure we're striking a healthy balance as we move forward. What I do in the book, the reason it's got that strange title, Hamless Blackberry, is that I go back in history and I look at other points in the evolution of human society where we've actually gone through moments like this before with a new technology that had this kind of potential. And I look in a practical way at how people at those moments, including Shakespeare's lifetime, dealt with the challenge of all this information, all this new connectedness. In his case, it was the printing press. And how did they make the best use of it? And so as we talk about the environment on this panel, I hope to throw out some, some perspective on that and some ideas about balance, which is sort of my mantra. So thank you. Can we build on that, actually? Because one of the constant themes that we've been talking about is there is this balance between the use of social media and kind of boots on the ground and getting it out there and doing things. I mean, you know, that, that was the power of so much of what's happening across the Middle East. Um, do we have examples of that in the environmental movement at all, or is it because environmental, environmentalists just like being outside and being on the ground anyway? Don't want to be behind a screen for eight hours. Um, so I think, I mean, I know for us, the, the balance between the online and the offline is, is what we're constantly trying to figure out. So how do we actually move? I mean, most of our people function online in some way um, within our network. But how do, we, how do we reach them through Twitter? How do we reach them on Facebook? But then actually get them to take action on the ground? Because for us, in the end, we want, we, we're trying to move politicians. We're trying to create change on the ground. And that's not going to happen just through you know, sending a tweet. Um, but we can mobilize people that way. And I, think, um, I don't think the broader environmental community has, has fully figured it out yet. Um, you know, they've started tweeting, but I think there's, you know, you also can tell the language of, to be honest, when someone who's 60 is sending a tweet out, uh, that it's different than the, lang the language and the tone of when I send a tweet. So, or when, our, when an 18 year old sends a tweet. Um, so I think that's another thing to think about is, you know, your audience with it. Um, so I think that is definitely the challenge. And what, the way we're looking at the online piece is really, uh, this is a way to take organizing to the next level. Um, so I think we still need the on the ground, face to face. Nothing will ever replace that. You know, the personal connection, uh, especially when you're. For us, we're trying to build a movement, um, and you can't build a movement when you can't see the person. Um, so, but but really using you know these other ways to to reach people, and I think get a message out quickly. I th that's been the most incredible thing for me. I mean, when I started college. I got an email. I, that was my first time I got, I got email. It was my freshman year of college. Um, and then cell phone my senior year of college. So started organizing without the technology um, and transitioning to it has been really, it's been kind of, it's been awesome. And watching, watching Facebook evolve as, as well. Um, so and I think that's the balance, though, is how do we layer it in, use this as a way to, to send a signal to move people but not be dependent on it. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, one of the things that has bothered me about the conversation of all things digital, but this question in particular, is the we're often presented with it as a binary choice, that you either have to be a true believer and we're building paradise and just spend as much time as possible online and it's all going to happen, or you are a Luddite and you want to throw these things out the window and you hate the whole thing. And to the extent that we have that conversation that way, I don't think we're going to get anywhere. The first time I got into this uh, was last fall, Malcolm Gladwell had a piece in The New Yorker basically suggesting that these tools will never be able to do what the tools of the 1960s did to start movements and make real social change happen. And he, he really had no nuance in the piece. It was basically, you know, this is a bad idea and all these people who believe in this stuff are crazy. And I was asked to participate in a forum about his piece on the New York Times, and my basic point was, why does it have to be binary? Why does it have to be either or? If you look back in history, every new tool has been used most effectively when it's been integrated with the older tools. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's where the power is. And it's the same point that, that I was making about making sure we continue to be connected to nature beyond the screen, because there's so much wisdom and inspiration to be gained from the very thing we're trying to save. And so basically, it's all about balance. Mm -hmm. Charles, uh, OK, I, I mean, just, just to add to that, I mean, I think, you know, to Amplify, I think a lot, of, a lot of people look at tools like Facebook, like at Twitter, as something that's completely new, whereas actually it takes a lot of the concepts that you have in the real world in terms of your relationships, relationships with people, what you share, and just amplifies it and give you, gives you a new way to do those things. I mean, just to kind of add to this conversation, I think that where, where there's a lot of power here, I mean, especially on Facebook. So if you think about Facebook as the place where you connect with the people you know in the real world, so you think about that, it's your friends, it's your family, it's your 
college friends, it's like the slightly mean girl from seventh grade who awkwardly friends you. And you like sit there and you're like, oh God. Um, but, you know, so, you know, you start there and then you think nothing is more powerful than the opinions and the recommendations of the people you know. So think about that. Today, you don't think about necessarily a restaurant from a reviewer's perspective. I mean, you might read that, but it's going to be much more powerful if your sister-in-law tells you about that restaurant. The same thing goes with the cause. When you put things in the perspective of the, your friends and the people you know, you're much more likely to engage and take action. And I think that's the underlying thing to, to really think about um, as we talk about these tools. And, it, and people have always gotten news and information from the people they, knew, they know. This is a new way to do that. Yeah, I think following on from that, I think the, the, the secret for me is that you have to, people have to connect with what you're, what you're saying, and they have to feel of some personal connection, and it has to be sort of, well, why should I care? And that, I think that's the big challenge. I think the, there's so much vying for our eyeballs. If you think about the internet and, and the social media, you've got 10 seconds of someone's time before they'll vanish off your page and go do something else. And, you know, things like Twitter kind of almost encourage this sort of, it's all about small, bite-sized summary chunks of information because people don't really want to get too involved or too deeply engaged in things. So how do you grab attention in, in a very, very short space of time? There's a thing called the pothole theory, which um, a friend of mine has blogged about a few times, where that, you know, you only care about a pothole if it's in your street. Right? You don't care about potholes if they're in other people's streets. So it's got to matter to you. Uh, in terms of the original question about the, the examples of where things have worked, um, there hasn't been a huge amount, in my experience, with mobile technology and SMS that's actually created some change. But one example I do know of was in Uganda about two or three years ago where the government sold off a community forest to an Indian sugar plantation company. And the communities around the forest mobilized through SMS. And they actually managed to stop the forest sale. Now, I think we heard about that because it was successful. I don't know how many campaigns have been started that haven't succeeded and therefore weren't reported on, but it does happen. But the key there is the people that engaged in that and made it happen, they were living around that forest. The pothole was in their street, and that's why they did it. Why somebody in the U.S. would want to engage in that, that's where it gets trickier, I think. Um, I, I, I think it's fascinating. I'm a big Twitter fan, and I do think it's interesting how you can actually develop a trusting relationship with a person, even on Twitter, that you, you really don't know at all. The opposite of what Charles is saying. I find Just it's, ask Anthony Weiner, I suppose, about that one. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> and in fact, you know, you know, the mistake he made, I think, was doing everything. It sounds like he did everything in the public feed. If you do a combination of direct messages and the public exchanges, it can really grow the trust because you're kind of going in the back room with someone and saying, hey, we have something in common. You know, let's have this other conversation. I have found that incredibly useful on Twitter, and those are the people I feel I know the best. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for, I work for an organization called Water for People, and one of the things that we see is very powerful in this is that, you know, NGOs often are the voice of people on the ground, right? We're the intermediaries, and we're going to filter it, and we're going to tell you the parts of what they say that, you know, that fit what we want you to hear and all that kind of stuff. I think the power of this um, at one level is to start hearing voices unfiltered by NGOs, development agencies, people working in there. And so that, and that's, that creates some real power because what, what potentially is going to happen is, um, you know, in the water sector, for instance, you could put in a water point and you could go and tell a donor you did a great job. You can take a picture of someone cutting a ribbon and a kid splashing water on their face. But it would be absolutely spectacular if a mother in that village was able to somehow get a message out that says basically, hey, our water system's broken. You know, the celebration is over. I'm back in the muddy puddle around the corner. And I think that's the real power of this. The challenge, I think, is, and, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear your views on this, is it's, very, it's still very written-based, right? And around the world, people learn and share and experience things in other ways. They experience it visually. They experience it through story. They experience it through video. I mean, do you see anything coming in that way that's going to actually build this a little more? I mean, I, I can say that the most successful um, movements on Facebook always have visuals attached. So if you think about your news feed and you think about everything that's coming in, so you've got updates from friends, you know, from local businesses, from nonprofits, if something's plain text, it never works as well as an image. The second thing about, I'm, I'm being very Facebook specific, but if Facebook is 70% XUS in terms of users. So it's a very, very global platform. So when you think about that and the power of visuals, when people are speaking different languages um, and, and are all over the world, so photo and video always are a huge hit there. Especially, I gotta say, anything that has to do with animals or babies, <laughs> people love. I'm serious, so a lot of the um, 
organizations like the Nature Conservancy or the Humane Society, they'll have Cat Week or something like that, and they'll just see their traffic go through the roof. Um, so it's interesting to look at the things that people naturally gravitate towards on the web, um, even some things that might be considered a little bit silly, but then how they take that and they turn it into a campaign, and it actually gets them um, a lot of awareness. Mm. Isn't there a commercial in the U.S. now? There's a cell phone that is selling itself on cats exchanging information. Did you yeah, see that? I, probably. No. That came from you. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Um, well, and I think with, in terms of the, the video piece of it, I think the integration of YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and emails is actually, I mean, that's, that's where I think you find the best. That's, that's when you, we can really maximize this. Um, so, you know, we have folks that will have them say, make a video to their senator or, you know, a video of what they're doing in their community to move us to 100% renewable energy. Um, and then that puts a face uh, to someone doing it. And then it also can send a message. Um, and we drive people to do that through sending a tweet um, and then through a mass email list. And I think um, that that's definitely been helping to kind of put a face to it and, and again, use this technology. One of the moments that I look at in my book, those moments from history, is ancient Greece, where the new technology was the alphabet, was writing itself. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, Socrates was a great opponent of the alphabet and said that this is going to destroy our minds and we mustn't use this and so forth. And we know this, of course, because Plato then used the alphabet to record the, the dialogue. <laughs> but, but in any case, I sort of make fun of Socrates for this because he kind of missed the point. But there is actually a wonderful way in which conversation, which was his preferred tool, and he was so good at it, takes you to places yeah. that textual exchanges don't, and people who live in parts of the world that are still really basically orally driven yep. know that. And I'm reminded of that every time I use Skype. It seems to get, which is also visual, of course, but the, I, I see people growing in their use of that particular technology and learning to have what feels like a, a real human conversation, which two years ago it didn't. When I first started doing Skype, it felt really awkward. And I don't know if they're speeding it up or something, but it's getting better as the way we use it, I think. Yeah, I think it's a great point. Yeah, I think uh, the interesting thing that we found in our work over the last sort of eight years is that if you give people just a little bit, they can actually make a lot from it. Some of the most interesting innovation comes out of scarcity. So if the whole world had smartphones and 4G and downloadable apps and all the wonderful stuff that we had, then you could kind of do anything. And for me, that's much less exciting than having a world where there are areas of, of high innovation, low innovation, there's areas of 4G, no G, you know, um, there's online, offline, and no line, as someone once told me. And, you know, people we work with are largely offline and have no line. Uh, and if you provide tools that allow people to take advantage of what is available to them, they're usually pretty good at figuring out the best way of using it. I think it's, it's um, you know, I sit in many conferences where you're kind of in nice hotels and you're far away in a fairly well-off country, sitting with fairly privileged people, trying to think, you know, how would a poor person do this? Well, why don't we give, give a few tools to the poor people and let them answer the question for us? And that's very much what we try to do with, with Frontline SMS. And you know, it's pretty amazing what people do end up um, using this, these kinds of tools for. So the challenge, I think, is sort of democratizing the tools that allow people to do mm. what's relevant to them. If, if uh, you know, 85% of people right now, the tools are SMS and voice, then we just have to live in the reality of that and try to build things that make the most of SMS and voice. And once video and the smart stuff's available, then we'll move on to that. But we, we can't sort of leapfrog the whole way without going through and making sure that we build appropriate technologies that work for people. Okay, so let's let's open it up. Oh, text oh, text messaging. Text messaging. Sorry. Yeah, short message service. European version. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So why why don't we open this up? Um, if you have any questions, I think there's a couple microphones around. Um, I don't think it's a particularly big room, so feel free to not use the microphone. Frankly, um, why don't we start over here and just sort of go that way? Oh, you need a microphone. I apologize. Yep. <laughs> need a microphone. <laughs> uh, that's right. Well done. We're going to use the technology. <laughs> that's spectacular. Yeah. Uh, my name is Morgan Williams. I, I, I actually lived in East Africa for, for quite a bit of time. And one of the most interesting people I, I, I met uh, was a developer of mobile technologies that connected rural villagers uh, with, with uh, communication service. So they could you know, they spend most of their day either traveling for water or, or going to markets to bring their goods to a place that they don't know if there's any market for anything mm -hmm. that they are bringing there. So they spend the whole day or days walking and, yep. and not knowing if a market exists. Um, so this guy developed a very simple application to connect people that have things to sell with buyers. And, and I'm wondering, you alluded to this a little bit, what other models you found out there in the world 
that are like that, and, and if you've heard of, of this particular uh, little technology that was developed. Just real quickly, I, it's a great question. Um, pastoralists in northern Kenya are using that now to figure out where the best prices for camel sales are, and they're developing their migratory, short-term migratory strategies around that, those, those indicators. So it's a great question. I think, I think the, third, the first point there is that, that text messaging is what people use. It's relevant and useful, and they understand it. So if you build anything in a place like East Africa, most markets that is yeah. based on text messaging, it will be used because people understand how that works. And I think, you know, from my experience, most of the really interesting stuff comes out of inefficiencies. You know, there's a market inefficiency or a health delivery inefficiency. And if you can find something very simple and low cost that meets that, and again, it's connecting to the person, right? So if the person engaging in the service will gain something from it, they will engage in it. If I'm a farmer who can access prices on my phone, which will give me a 20% in income increase, and it costs me 10 shillings to send that message, I'll happily send that message and pay that cost because the overall benefit will be more money for, for my crops. And the same for healthcare. If I have to travel a day to go to a clinic, which might be shut, but I can check the opening hours by a text message, I will do that because it's going to save me a day of travel and the costs and the time lost in my field associated with that. So, um, I mean, there's plenty of examples of things like that, you know, medicine reminders via text message in developing countries, um, people able, being able to report corruption or um, bribery. Um, again, that's an interesting one because you have to really think about if I send a message in to say I've been bribed or someone's tried to take money off me, is that going to lead to any kind of meaningful change? And some people who don't believe it will won't engage in that service. So there's that kind of decision to be made there. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of really interesting innovations coming out of East Africa. And the best people to build those tools are the people who actually experience the problem, right? I think the greater the distance between the problem and the problem solver, the less chance you've got of actually finding a solution that works. And, I mean, Kenya's become a hub of this, isn't it? I mean, Kenya's become the next kind of Silicon Valley of Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's been amazing. I mean, it's, it's incredible. I mean, there's a, yeah, I mean, there's a place called iHub in Nairobi, iHub, which yeah. has been set up recently with, with money from the Omidyar Network, which is the founder of eBay. He set up a network. Uh, and they've got business people. They've got the education sector. They've got technologists. They've got computer yep. science students. And they've just created this kind of perfect storm, a mini Silicon Valley, in a sense, if you like, where some really, really amazing stuff. Kenya's a leading country for mobile payments. You know, if we were in Nairobi now, we could pay for a taxi outside here with our mobile phone. Now, we're in the U.S. and we can't do that, right? So who's innovating? That's the leading country in the world for mobile in the world, payments? Yeah. By far, actually. 35% of Kenya's GDP goes through a mobile payment service, which is actually a very scary number. Yeah, it's called, it's called M-Pesa, and I think the Kenyan government are getting a bit worried about it, to be honest with you. If you actually, if you want to look, you should look at the story of M-Pesa, because it's actually fascinating. How do you spell um, it? M-P-E-S-A. Yes. And it... And it it emerged because banks, I can't remember the numbers, it was something like only 5% of Kenyans had access to banks. Yeah. And so Mpeza went to banks first and said, hey, you know, how about using some mobile money to move it and all that kind of stuff? And they thought they were crazy. And they set it up through Safaricom, and it's now enormous. I mean, it, and it's spread to other countries. It's actually fa it's a great case study if you want to see it. So, um, I, again, I'm just going to move through there. So, Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask... Um, uh, in addition to the, all, all the opportunities that social media offers organizing, um, also the concerns about security and surveillance that also arise with this kind of um, massive social media, especially in reference to organizing. I mean, I th yeah, I think that there's definitely a, a security concern. I mean, at this point, I, I'm pretty convinced that everyone can find anything out about me they want possible on the internet. So um, I, I, I think that um, at least for our organizing, which I think it varies what you're organizing around, um, ours is we're trying to build, we want, we want information everywhere as fast as possible, um, and we want to connect people um, as much as humanly possible. So I think that is a concern. Um, it's not something that we actually are, think too much about. Um, in that forum that I mentioned that I did in the New York Times about this question, one of the other contributors, I think it was Evgeny, I don't know how to say his last name, Morozov, um, made the point that, referring to Gladwell's argument about the 60s, that if we had had Twitter and Facebook in the 60s, you can bet the Ku Klux Klan would have been on there too, monitoring everything and using that information to track their opponents. And I think the same goes today. You know, when an SMS is sent out about corruption or something of a government, of course, that person has to be careful you know, about who else is reading it. We're all living so much in public. We have to factor that in. Mm -hmm. yeah, yesterday in the news, there was the, the Google hack where the, uh, the computer 
Trade Centers, and where the Chinese government has a strategic center, came out and identified. Um, sorry, the Chinese government came out and identified journalists, political opponents, and and people all around the world, reaching all around the world, and then got their passwords and so on. And, hmm. uh, it's, it's a very chilling scenario. It's yeah. chilling. I think you can, break, you can break down social media campaigns into two categories. One, that if people engage in it, they're not going to come to any harm. Yeah. And two, if someone engages in it, they could end up in prison. Yeah. And you have to be very, very careful which of those camps you're in because people do get killed. In Iran, a lot of people got disappeared during the Iranian uprising because they tweeted and texted and did stuff with their phones. Yeah. And, and I think... You know, to be frank, there, there are the right tools for right things. So, for example, from, from a Facebook perspective, we have pretty sophisticated privacy settings, and you can choose what to show and what not to. Um, I think part of what we've really done on Facebook and is, is, is authentic identity. And people having authentic identity thereby makes a lot of things more compelling. But maybe if you're worried, tools like Twitter, where you can have kind of a handle that's not necessarily your real identity, might be something more useful. And I think it's really case by case in a lot of ways in terms of, you know, there isn't one tool that's perfect for everything. So you want to use the right tools the right way. Well, circumvention technologies are becoming a very big issue right now, how you can circumvent um, government restrictions on the Internet. Great. Um, hi, my name is Robert Egger, and I'm here to talk about food, but I also wear another hat, which is I'm very interested in the political organization of the nonprofit sector as a whole in America. And I'd just like to put this out there because, for example, Colorado is a classic example. Last year, Mayor Hickenlooper was running for governor. And here's a guy who has the first mayor in America who had an, uh, an office of strategic social investment. You know, a, a cabinet level position that was dedicated to getting the best, maximizing the relationship between City Hall and the nonprofit sector. Yet, if you walk down any street in Colorado, the dry cleaner, any business can put up, vote for whoever. Nonprofits can't. We're, in theory, not allowed to be partisan. Twitter potentially allows individual nonprofit um, employees, many of whom are terrified that if they say something political, the IRS will come and take away their 501, and then we'll be able to do the work. So they, they remain silent. 14 million employees remain, for the most part, silent, unless they are brave enough to speak about their specific issue. Mm -hmm. But to really to create some kind of an aggregate hashtag where I might say, my name is Robert Edgar, the person, and I'm voting for this person because they understand the power of nonprofits, hashtag Colorado nonprofits vote. There's a powerful tool that could really wake up the latent political power of the nonprofit sector so we get out of this kind of quagmire of having to chase grants and really start to build political capital to elect a generation of people who understand social enterprise, microcredit, and the role we play. So I think that that, that is a real powerful tool for us. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think what, you, what you'll find a lot um, is that people will have kind of the organization, and then when they have their personal identity on a tool, they'll put in their info that the views here are my own or what have you. So a lot of people are really careful about that, and I think that's more and more common. Mm -hmm. Yep, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I'm John Sturman from the MIT Sloan School of Management, and I have a challenge for all of you. Uh, and let me tell you a quick story first. In March, the Congress held hearings on the Energy Tax Prevention Act of 2011, which would prohibit the EPA from using its authority to regulate greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most distinguished climate scientists, Richard Somerville, testified. And, uh, of course, he testified that climate change is happening now. It's real. It's caused by humans, and we need to do something. And then Representative Mike Burgess of Texas, who's a, uh, an opponent of doing anything, said, listen, if what you say is right, and I'm quoting now, uh, why haven't you closed the deal with the American public? Why is it when I go to my town halls, the people there are not clamoring for me to control carbon in the atmosphere? So it seems to me that communication is working just fine. And the problem is there's not enough support for good policies on climate change. This is an area I do research in. And what we know is that people have, all kinds of people, including MIT graduate students, have uh, serious misconceptions about how the climate works that lead them to think there's more time than there really is. So my challenge for you is, I understand the pothole theory, I think that's exactly right. Climate change doesn't work that way. By the time there's enough potholes on your street that are caused by climate change, it's just too late. So how can social media help people come to a deeper understanding of the science that we have today that they don't appreciate today uh, that is not getting out? The IPCC has utterly failed in this respect, and I just wrote a paper for them on this. Uh, you know, the scientific case is getting stronger and stronger. Public support for action is going down. So what can you all do to help us with that and get so, people out in the street? 
That's a great question. Yeah. So I think that, that I agree with you. Um, I mean, I think that social media, the, the great thing about it is it serves two purposes, which is one, it educate an educational space, um, as well as a mobilizing space. Um, and I think, again, it's how you use it, the way you use it, the, the message. Um, and again, I think generationally, that's going to vary um, issue based. Um, and I think for us, it, it, again, it's, it's having a plan, and then we can't completely rely on that. So I think um, right now there's actually folks have been organizing around the Mercury hearings that are happening. Um, and the way that that's been working is sending you know tweets and Facebook and using uh, mass emails to let people know about it, but then we still have to follow up with calling people and actually moving them to the actual hearings. And so I think the integration of that is the critical piece. Um, and, I, and it's not to scale. I mean, I think that's the other thing is um, – you know, it's, we're just like, our, our, for example, our Twitter list um, is 6,000, which is not a lot, really. But we can move a message to those 6,000 people instantly. Um, and we, we've been doing that. And people will make calls. Like we can say, go, you know, call Boehner. Um, you know, he sucks. And then they'll do it. Um, and so I think, and then we have a way of tracking it. And I think That's the okay. environmental orgs, <laughs> in a nonpartisan way, um, <laughs> the environmental orgs um, have yet to fully grasp that, I think. Um, to be honest, yeah, I, I think to I think to add to that, I, I feel like um, a, a lot of a lot of what's going on. I think the environmental crisis seems a little bit intimidating, and I think a lot of what happens on social media is about accessibility. So, and I, I don't know what what the message is, or right. if it's campaign based, or, or what that is. But I feel like by making it less overwhelming and a little bit more accessible, people are much more likely to engage in it. I think right now they tend to be overwhelmed, especially if it's coming from an agency or something that feels really top down. They, they don't necessarily know how to interact with it in the best way. I think, you know, the three things that, that, that I see that work really well in campaigns is first and foremost is having a voice and having authenticity. So I think when it comes to causes, people don't necessarily want to interact with a property or an organization. They want to interact with human beings and the people behind those organizations. So you want an organization to have a really specific, very human and personal voice. Um, second is in engagement. And this goes back to what you were talking about, slacktivism. You know, what's, what's beyond the like button? I mean, I think slacktivism isn't a term I love. I think it's good that anyone's getting, you know, the attention or actually the engagement to like. But there, there's a second piece. And it's engaging people after they've liked your page. You know, getting them to comment, getting them to share with their friends. Um, and then the third piece is virality. So how do you make your message um, go viral? And I think if, if, if we can figure out or, you know, organizations can figure out what the accessible piece is, and then bring in those three concepts, I think there's a lot more room for success uh, when it comes to that. But like I said, I, I don't necessarily have the, the answer of what that piece is, but I think those are the concepts to be built in there. I think you could reframe that question as an elephant conservation organization or a tiger conservation organization, or in fact, almost any NGO who is trying to figure out how to engage and get people to do stuff. And I think the, it's not necessarily for me in the delivery mechanisms because they're kind of there. It's putting the technology to one side for a couple of days and saying, how do we put together a message which will encourage somebody to take some action or to care? And if Twitter and Facebook are the ways of then delivering that, that's great, but it might be the radio. I think it goes back to my earlier point that I think sometimes we lead with the technology. So the question shouldn't be, how do we use social media to get our message out? The question should be, how do we build a message that resonates? And then what do we use to get it out? And just to follow on that point, which is which I really agree with, and Charles's point, um, I just coming here as a non-environmental expert, I think the problem is language too. I mean, I've gone to a lot of the sessions here, and I didn't know half of the terms that were being used. And I'm a presenter, and <laughs> you know, I think that if you really want to get the masses out there marching about this, say it in there. You know, forget the jargon the acronyms, the abbreviations, you know, say it in their language and so that they feel they understand. This is what, you know, the civil rights movement really took off and the changes happened when everybody who wasn't affected by all these horrors came on board because it, it was given a human face and it was spoken about in, by Martin Luther King and others in simple language. to have uh, marched uh, against the, the Vietnam War and, and then later against nuclear power and, and uh, Star Wars, et cetera. 
There's a big difference, and I don't think it's in the social media. The big difference is everybody in America could see the harm caused by segregation. Everybody in America, now some of them chose not to see. Everybody in America could imagine their son or their neighbor's son coming home from Vietnam in a body bag. And everybody in America could imagine themselves incinerated in a nuclear war. That's not true about climate change. It's just not visceral. And uh, so mm -hmm. I don't think it's so much about the media, but I want more help in make it, in using these tools to make it more visceral so that you, you can get as many hits for action on climate change as for cute kittens. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so to add to the list that you all suggested, I think we're going to have to come up with some really interactive, accessible simulations, which is what we're trying to do. But uh, yeah. Yeah. We're, we're not the experts on the social media side. So we need help and you know, be happy to partner with anybody. And, and that's what's exciting is the tools are there. Yeah. yeah. I, th I think we all... We all see, you know, multiple problems out there, but the question we have to ask ourselves is, well, why should I care about that one more than that one? And the, why should I care at all? And the social media allows you to put more of a face to the problem, which I think is the other component of it, especially with climate change. You know, actually showing folks that live next to a coal plant that talk about, you know, I'm in Chicago, 42 people died because of the, this coal plant, is a very different story, and you, you can see it when someone's, you know, talking into YouTube and then you send it out over Twitter, that sends a message that I think resonates with more people. But that's a larger, and in conversations all the time with the broader environmental community about how we talk about it. And as someone who does not come from the climate change space, you can't you say climate change and people's eyes gloss over. Um, so it's a mm -hmm. much larger You know, it, it is also interesting the power that, a, that one viral video that's a story can have for people. I'll tell you, in my own world of trying to urge people to strike a better balance in their digital lives, the vi the viral video of the woman in the mall walking into the fountain, with the that it really it sort of changed the whole conversation. That one video, all I have to do is mention that in a speech now, and everybody laughs and remembers it and is in on the conversation. And maybe if there were more of those, I don't know what they would be. You know, polar bears on ice floes, or you know, something that would really wake people up and be a story you know, that they could tell each other that would help. I was actually at dinner last night, and um, a daughter and a father sat at the table, and they were on their phones the entire time. They didn't say a word to each other. It was no. remarkable. They talked more to the waitress than no. to each other. It was amazing. Uh, I get a kick out of watching social media evolution. If anybody remembers Friendster, yeah. MySpace, and <laughs> Facebook, and Twitter, I was... I was wondering if you guys in, in your everyday work have a sense of what's coming up next. And also, a, a follow-up question to that, as a young person that, that's involved in the nonprofit world and doing activism, I get a lot of sense that a, a lot of these nonprofits are trying to create their own version of Facebook. I'm wondering if that's just repetitive of creating the wheel. Is that something that you, you especially as, as Facebook see as helping the, the cause, or is that totally just... Yeah, I mean, so I, I can start with that point. I think it goes back to um, kind of what, what we've all been saying is that every tool has its own use. Um, so you might think about, um, you know, Facebook as the place where you connect with the people you know in the real world. Twitter is the place for real-time news and events, or maybe the, the people you wish you knew <laughs> and you want to get updates from. YouTube is about video. Maybe your own social network um, is about meeting people that have the same interests that you that you do that you don't necessarily know in the real world. It's just about having a strategy about how you're using each one, and they all work together. So it's about using them the right way so that they work together really effectively. I think in, in terms of, of what's coming next, I think we're going to see a lot of interesting things, but I think as, you know, with kind of the, the global aspect of social media and the internet and what it's bringing, I think you're going to see so much more on mobile because people are accessing, accessing so much more on simpler devices um, all over the world when they don't have access to computers or high speed and things like that. And I think we're going to continue to see that space really, really blow up. So, I mean, of, of our 500 million active users on Facebook, over 200 million of them use Facebook via their mobile phone. Um, so, and that number will continue to grow. So it kind of gives you a perspective on, on where that's going. I, I think predicting the future is going to always be a challenge. Technology is moving so fast that you find yourself in a place in six months' time you never expected. If you go back five years and read all of the predictions for social media, none would have mentioned Twitter. It, it didn't exist, right? I mean, it's, it's come out and just re, it's redefining so much about mainstream media and social media, but it's, it's, it's shaken the industry up. So I think you'd be a fool to try and 
predict the next big thing. But in terms of reinventing wheels, absolutely, there's a lot of that that happens in the NGO world. The reason that no one's going to reinvent a Facebook in, in a hurry is that you know, you've got, I don't know, half a billion eyeballs there. And I've noticed increasingly uh, over the last few months in the UK that almost all product adverts have the Facebook URL now and not their company URL. Whether nonprofits do that, I don't know. Maybe they should be doing that too. I, I mean, they should be doing it more. I think so. The new Nielsen numbers um, show that on average, people spend 7.7 .7 hours a month uh, on Facebook. So you obviously want to be where people are. I think the closest to that is Yahoo. It's 2.3 hours a month. Um, so you know, you want to be where people are spending their time and, and have a presence there. And I think so. This is really interesting. This another thing that excites me. I feel like a year ago we're having a lot of the same conversations with brands about how they should market their Facebook presence, and they're there and they're rocking it. So I think the nonprofit space. I feel like it's really coming along and, and giving tips like that about how to advertise their presence and things like that, I think we're really going to see a boom there. Um, one of the things that futurists, the mistake they make when they try and predict the future is they, they try and predict the future just thinking about the technology and focusing on sort of almost the needs of the technology and how can that grow rather than how can people's needs go through the technology. And I think the way to be more accurate is to think about the things in these media that we're using today that are flaws in your own life things that they're not doing for you, like maybe it's not offering you enough privacy or it's, got, it's bringing in too many distractions, this particular device that you're using or whatever. The next wave might well be the devices and the software and so forth that solve those very problems that you're feeling in your own life. I think your own life is always the best predictor of the future. That's great. We've got a lot of questions, but we thankfully have a lot of time still, so we're good. I'm going to get to everyone, but I'm going to continue to go one by one because I think it's working pretty well. So. Um. So I'm Caroline, and I work for a local nonprofit in Aspen. Um, and my question actually ties in really well to what we're just talking about. I've been thinking a lot about how organizations and large companies all have a Facebook page now. And, instead of, and like you're saying, instead of having their URL, they have, like, like us on Facebook. Mm -hmm. and, and in some ways, this is like a great equalizer, right? Like these huge corporations that spend so much money on their website now just have a Facebook page. Um, but I wonder how how this is going to continue into the future. Like, is there a danger of this, that we only have one sort of organizational forum for our information? Um, we have this beautiful website at the organization I work for, and I kind of I spend more time on Facebook putting things up than I do on that website, and I love that website. <laughs> and I kind of am like, well, why don't they go to that? But I, I think it's, it's great in some ways, but I wonder um, how it's going to continue. I have really good news for you um, that I'm, I see increasingly, is that um, for a lot of nonprofit organizations, and, and not just nonprofits, um, that we're becoming the number one referral to their website, referral source, um, which, is, which is really exciting. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give kind of a little story in the nonprofit space, which I, I really like, and I love this as an example, but have you heard of Movember before? So for those of you who don't know, it's a men's health um, charity. It's three Australians that decided, you know, one day, what happened to the mustache? It's the sign of a true gentleman. And, you know, they started to get people to sponsor growing mustaches every November for men's health. And they raised $78 million last year in six countries. And the number one referral source was their Facebook page, which I think accounted for 17 or 18 percent of their total donations. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I think that that's kind of the good news is that they weren't necessarily raising their money directly on Facebook, but Facebook became the number one referral source to the website, which had all those tools, hmm. which is exciting. And I think there's also a lot of uh, connection. So on, we are developing a new platform. We are powershift.org. And, and uh, it's a website, blog, but also connects to Twitter, connects to Facebook. Um, so you can cross post. Um, and I think that that's, I mean, I don't know if it's the future, but I, I know for us, we're finding that as a great way to cross over into the multiple mediums that our folks are in. One, one word of caution I'd say with, although Facebook's wonderful, mm -hmm. um, not to put all your social media eggs in one basket. Yeah. Um, the problem with a lot of these sites, there's a service called TwitPic, which is a, a service you can post your pictures to Twitter. They recently changed their terms of service so they could actually, I think they either own the copyright or they could distribute and use any of your photos without your permission. It created a big stink right now. If your entire online strategy is on Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg decides to change the terms of use of Facebook in some way which you don't like, you're stuffed, right? So just to put the sort of slight words of caution on, on this. Make sure that you use a, a range of tools and a range of things to, to complement a social media strategy. I would say using one social media tool is not a strategy. Right. I, I mean, you want, you want to use everything that's available. And like I said, every tool has a different use and has a different crowd. Mm -hmm. Facebook do change their terms of use quite often. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, it's, it's just a reality. They, yeah. Not, yeah, yeah, they videoed you shaking your head yes. So. <laughs> well, and I mean, you know, the, 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 the terms change with the needs, you know. Oh, it's not a criticism. It's just it's something people should be aware of. I think there's a, maybe a lack of awareness of the risks of sometimes getting into these things. And, you know, also bear in mind, um, Ted Fishman made a great point in a panel the other day that the human lifespan now exceeds the lifespan of just about everything else on that we deal with in life, including big corporations, Fortune 500 corporations. And we, all, we tend to be prisoners of the present and think that the big players of this moment are always going to be the big players. But that leaves out innovation and competition. And, you know, I think there are going to be challenges to Facebook that will probably make Facebook better. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the world's going to be richer and more complicated as we go forward in a good way. Yeah. And there's room for a lot of players, which is exciting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, actually, I have a question, but I also wanted to make a point. I, I teach, and what I have found is the final project in my class is a video. Mm -hmm. And it's a viral mm -hmm. video they have to do on a lot of the environmental issues they could pick through. I had a brilliant one this past semester, and I said to him, you need to post this on Facebook and YouTube. And he said, well, here it is to grade, but let me work on it more before I do that. Uh -huh. and I, just, I would talk about value that for him, he was really putting himself out there, yeah. and he, had, he really wanted to even up the ante. But forget the grade, or, you know. But, and so I think it just shows what you're saying, how important it is and how much he was living in that world. Mm -hmm. um, but the question I have for you when you talk about integrating and all this stuff and having interactive information, what do you all think of Al Gore's Our Choice app that's come out and how, are you familiar with it, with the book? No. A little bit. Okay. Have you looked at it? No more than that. Um, I haven't, no. Oh, okay. Um, it's called Our, Our Choice, and what it is um, is, and I, I think it was actually some Apple folks that made it, his book Interactive, where all the videos, uh, all the pictures in the book, as you scroll through it on your iPad or your iPhone, um, come to life, mm -hmm. can show where you are in relation to where the issue is. Mm -hmm. You can actually hit on an area, and it'll then dig down in the data from the graph. Our, our, our Choice. And so you can download the app. I think it's $4.99. Um, but I'm just curious, because it does that integration piece where it interacts with you. There's video piece, and so it's a book, but it's an interactive book. And I was just curious how that ties into some of the things you were talking about. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think, again, it, it has to be something that people want to look at. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, that, I mean, I think it's a great idea. I think it's, again, g making it something that people want. And, and, and from my perspective, and when we're talking about Facebook or Twitter specifically, you know, or YouTube, you want to set things up in a way so that they elicit a response. Because when people take an action on your page, then that generates a news feed on, story in their news feed. On average, a Facebook user has 150 friends. So that's the potential for 150 eyeballs, and, and that's how things go viral. And that's I think, why you want the engagement there in terms of spreading the news. Yeah, and a very quick, quick point on that first, the first comment you made about, you know, getting it perfect and so on. There's, a, there's a, a, an open source software ethos that's release early, release often. Yeah. And I think most of the most powerful videos on YouTube that actually get create movements are grainy, shaky, very, very yeah. badly filmed, but they, they are powerful. Yeah. And I think True. that's the message. You could spend months cra crafting a wonderful video, and then the issue's gone. Yeah. So, yeah. Right, yeah. Yep. Courtney hit this one early on, and it's and this is my concern is that these media you, you can so particularize your message that you actually aren't building a movement. You're yeah. attracting the more you have your little core, mm -hmm. and that core is not talking to the other folks. And as this whole conference has been about, is that all these problems that we are dealing with are not environment problems. And don't worry about not being environment experts because it's not an environment problem. It's a it's a human People. global problem, mm -hmm. and we're trying to link all these pieces together. So I wish you'd just address a little bit about how using so how you could use social media in a way that actually ex expands your your audience and mm -hmm. brings people in to look at a variety of issues instead of just getting the the true believers more connected. So one of the things that I think that's that's very much something that we're consciously or continually struggling with is you know our Twitter users are the same people on Facebook um, and then our email list. So how do we yeah, how do we grow that? And I think what we found is um, going into, and again, different, this isn't a very for small community organizations, um, but going to, you know, concerts, like we're sending a team of people to Bonnaroo uh, next week, two weeks, um, and our whole purpose there is going to be list building. So getting people, talking to them, these are not necessarily folks that are thinking about climate change, um, but get them excited um, about what we're talking about, and we use, we'll be using very different messaging there, um, and get them on a text list, um, and then using that to then drive them to our website. So um, it's a little bit more of an integrated strategy, but I think um, that's one of the ways we're looking at kind of expanding out of it. Because otherwise, if you keep pumping into your same space, uh, you're just keeping the, cultivating. Um, although Twitter, I mean, if you start using different hashtags on Twitter, 
um, you can you can move into different circles by using different words. Um, so. I, I think it would help actually immensely if nonprofits would get together and collaborate and share resources and and not compete on these issues. I think there's more save the white rhino NGOs in Africa than there are white rhinos. You know, they're kind of trying to save one each. And, you know, if, 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 if someone's competing against you with a completely different issue, that's fair enough. But if you have 5,000 NGOs all competing for your eyeballs on the climate change issue, why not yeah. get together and, you know, you've got a much better chance of actually getting some kind of action. And that's one thing that frustrates me about the nonprofit sector. It is extremely competitive for whatever reason, egos funding yeah. or whatever. So forget the technology, right? Just get the personality issues sorted out and just work together. And I think that would make the biggest difference. Easier said than done. I had a quick question on uh, content of what is working. Um, you kind of said that visual helps a lot on Facebook, but you know, a, a challenge for public media or for anybody is how to get that conversion ratio up of your subscribers to actual activists. So that that also what you were saying about slacktivism versus activism. I mean, if I had a million viewers a night. I could just get them to give me 20 bucks. You yeah. would never have to go beg for Congress to give us any money, right? Mm -hmm. But there's that huge free rider policy where people feel like, oh, I can retweet you. I really support you. No, actually, I need you 20 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, you know, what do I, what do I, what, what are the exact kind of calls to action that you've seen work really well um, that, that you've been able to measure and say this translated to this versus when I said it this way, it didn't work that well. And when I included a video, it did work. When I didn't include a video, it didn't work. How do I, how do you look at that? Great question. Mm. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I think uh, the one of the places we found success, we're, we're constantly trying different messages um, within our folks. And I know for us, the anti-corporate going after the Koch brothers um, has been a really strong message for young people. Um, Thank you. Um, and uh, the, our, one of our largest actions when we sent out a map, we have an email list of about 180,000 people. Um, and our, one of our largest clicks and actual move into action was when we asked folks to shadow their elected official during in district last August. Um, and hold, you know, it was about calling into question the amount of money they're getting from corporations. Uh, we had a video of someone that had, had called out Claire McCaskill and we had a whole video on it. Um, so people got to see, oh, that's what that looks like. It's, it's a little scary, but kind of awesome. Um, and then we had um, about 6,000 clicks, which was our largest at that point ever. Um, and, and then I think it turned into about 300 people actually doing it in the field. Um, so that was, I think, the, again, a video of showing someone, I mean, making it the accessibility is the key thing. Um, so if you're asking someone to do something online, showing them what it looks like helps, at least we found. Right. I think it, it varies. And I, and I, I mean, you might have some other thoughts on this, but I, I know we're still toying with it and, uh, trying to, I mean, it's mess. It's all about the message. I mean, it's all about the subject line in an email or, you know, the picture that's the Facebook image, you know, is, is it a cat or which apparently seems to work. So we might try cats, but I mean, yeah, I, so, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the, uh, like the general rules, I mean, I, I kind of touched it on a little before is a, the authenticity in the voice. That, that it comes from real people. That's, that's where you're going to hook people at the start. And then second, you want to have developer relationships. You want to be active in commenting back and connecting with people and, and getting close to them because once you have that connection, they're much more likely to take an action. Three, you know, having the visuals so you know, people are drawn to, to your page and what you're doing when their news feed um, is very crowded. Um, and then four, setting things up for a response. Just like I said before, asking people questions, getting them to respond, you know, getting things um, to go viral. Um, you know, and when it comes, we were talking about this this morning. If you've never read David Pluff's book, The Audacity to Win, it's very interesting because they talk about how they used messages very differently um, during the campaign so people didn't get bored with emails. Um, so they would have... You know, Michelle Obama sent out an email or come, an email come from Michelle that was angry or then one that was from Barack Obama that was hopeful and then one from David Pluff. So they would change it up so people weren't bored with what was coming through. And then they had this call to action about, you know, giving small amounts, um, which, which was pretty fascinating. Yeah. This is something that we talked about at our breakfast, actually, that the challenge, one of the challenges of this medium is the need for newness and ever changing, you know, because it's a real time medium. Mm -hmm you're constantly having to deliver something new and that can be that can you, you can do that really badly and cheapen it by just 
offering newness for the sake of newness. Mm -hmm. But if you're basing the newness, as in this case, on real people and their personalities and their authentic way of speaking about a message, I, that seems to have a much higher conversion rate, Absolutely. it seems to me. And, yeah. and it does for me. If you, and if you combine it with story, then you've got the ultimate ability to bring people on board, I think. And one of the things that we're about to do uh, this next week is there's a march uh, on Blair Mountain. There, It's under, right now, they're potentially looking to blow it up for mountaintop removal. Um, and there's a march of 500 people that are going to be physically marching, and then we're going to do a virtual march. So each day, we've never really done this, so we're trying it out. Um, each day, we'll be sending out emails to people asking them to do a different action in solidarity with the people on the ground. Um, so calling uh, calling the, the president to to put a moratorium on, on MTR, calling Congress, you know, asking different steps along the way. Um, so it's kind of a new thing that we're trying and seeing how it works. And again, using Twitter to drive people. Mm. I'd also say that re recognizing and rewarding people is important. Um, that, that, and having targets for people to want to reach. So, you know, if you're looking for money, you want to reach a certain target. If people can see their contribution, getting you closer to it and recognizing them by name or by Twitter handle or, you know, in some way so they can feel themselves contributing. I lived, when I lived in Finland for a year, people would pay money to get their name, you know, scrolling across the side of a TV screen. And, you know, the amount of money the TV stations made purely because people just love to see their names coming up on telly. So maybe you could have that on your program. You know, people would, people would donate to get their money on the screen. Um, but I think also a very, very quick example, we had a guerrilla um, campaign. When I worked for an organization called Fauna and Flora International a few years ago, we ran a guerrilla competition to win a, safari, a guerrilla safari to Kenya. And we collected a very, very good list of people that we knew were interested in guerrillas because they entered the competition. We then sort of started to feed them information about, you know, obviously the winner was announced and so on. We fed them information, but the ask for money was very much later on. And what we did is that when, when a new gorilla was born or a couple of new gorillas, we'd text them and say, you know, thanks to your support and your donations and so on or whatever, there are now three more mountain gorillas in the wild. You know, thank you very much. Reply with blah to, to donate another $5. Yeah. And it actually worked very well. Um, it wasn't just about the ask. Everyone's after money. So if, if, if you engage them first and ask later, and then they can see how what they've given has contributed to the success of what you're doing, you're more than likely to get those kind of repeat givers. Maybe NPR is very good at that. In a I, sense. I, I totally agree. I mean, leading with monetization is one of the worst things you can do. Yeah. It's absolute death. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I guess I just wanted to talk a little bit differently about climate change. <clears throat> I get a little confused by the goal here because we, we continuously try to figure out a way to get millions and millions of people on our Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts, et cetera, when you know, all the change that we've made to date, whether it be RPS legislation or other things, all happened because we had 200 dedicated people that actually took, took care of business, right? So um, at local level, city council level things, or state government, or, I mean, even, and even in Missouri, right, that entire RPS um, ballot initiative was about, I think it was 12 people. Um, and then we ended up having 20, like, I think it was like 10,000 people or so that did the, the vote getting, you know, the getting it on the ballot piece. And then 67% of Missourians voted for it, right? So it's not like... It's not like we actually have to bring the public along. When, when they have a choice, they actually vote for us usually. Yes. Yeah, I mean, and I think this comes back down to the need for what exactly what you're saying, what we're trying to get. And um, I know, again, for us, the new media side is really meant not to be our primary tool. Um, we still... I mean, we have 10,000 people, and having organizers and states actually moving those and running direct campaigns is what's winning. Like, we're shutting down coal plants on college campuses, and it's not because of Twitter. It's because we have, a, you know, a set of students that are moving the administration, moving the policy to make that happen. And I think um, that in terms of the actual winning on issues, it's still the boots on the ground that's going to do it. Uh, the way, again, we're looking at the, the Twitter, Facebook site is, is more about um, creating a larger frame. I mean, I think, you know, we're not going to have, I, I don't think we're going to have the Egyptian revolution anytime soon in the United States, but we want to give this broader sense of being a part of something bigger. And I think that's, that's at least what I've seen missing in the, in the, the youth climate space. Um, and again, I, I mean, I think among young people in general, um, and, and everyone, I think doing things, you want to know that there's other people out there that are doing something and that care also. And so I think that's where Twitter and Facebook, um, help show that um, and show that connectivity to things that are happening. And I think, especially as we bring it to around the world, I mean, it's incredible to know that people are, are fighting, you know, doing the same thing in Kenya that we're doing, you know, in Arizona. So um, I think it's layering it, in, layering it in and not allowing it to dominate. There is, a, there is a tendency of human beings, I don't know why we do this exactly, to want to believe the machine can do more than we can and to, to be cheering the machine 
rather than the immensely more powerful potential of, of even one person. You know, people often attribute the Protestant Reformation to the printing press, but it wouldn't have happened if one guy hadn't gone to a church door and nailed a piece of paper on there with 99 ideas on it. You know, that's really where the power is, and we should remind each other that on social media itself, keep telling ourselves that because that's what matters. Yeah, absolutely. I think the personal story is so important. And if you think about the, the Haiti disaster and the, the Ushahidi crowdsourced map, which ended up getting all the reports of fallen buildings and people trapped, that was started by a guy who had friends who were working in Haiti who was concerned about what was happening. And he threw a map up, and it became the central coordination point for the international relief effort. But the beauty of the story isn't the technology. It's the fact that some average guy was concerned enough, and the tools were available that allowed him to do that. That's, that's the exciting bit. Okay, we, got, we have time for one more question, and someone grab the mic, so there you go. <laughs> Love me. Uh, Trevor Monroe, I'm a technologist, and I have a brother who runs a nonprofit environmental organization called Freshwaters Illustrated. Um, I saw something really fascinating happen. His challenge was to get how do, how do they get you know, scientists, freshwater ecosystem uh, ecologists kind of talking and sharing their work. And he started a Facebook page about uh, six months ago. Mm-hmm. And their tactic was to post a photo of the week, and I've seen, you know, it's really kind of flourished. They're really getting traction and geeked out about these pictures of and what fish look like and insects are doing, you know, this time of year. And it's fascinating. So I guess my question is, what can a nonprofit like that, uh, where can they go to, to figure out how, how to scale, uh, how, to, how to get a coherent strategy? So, yeah. We actually, uh, I will, I, we just launched it last week. We have a resource center for nonprofits that lives at facebook.com slash nonprofits. So it has case studies, tips and tricks, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I think one of the key things there is, well, there are two things. So for a lot of nonprofits or movements that are just starting out, I think starting with some really simple programming always helps because people always ask me, I don't know how often to post. I don't know what to post. What am I doing? I was actually having a conversation with Deb about this this morning. Is maybe you want to have loose programming like kick off with a message of the week on Mondays or have photo of the week and something like that. Test it out, see what works, and then, and then build off of that. So. And, and there are tips on how to do that kind of stuff on our resource center. I mean, it's interesting. There's there's photos of the day from about seven different water nonprofits, and frankly, it's also gotten boring. You know, it, it, people have, and and I think there's now evidence that they stopped doing it. So I think you I think you're right. I think you got to start these things. You got to seed them, and then you got to move on a little bit. You got to think of how how to roll. And I'll, I'll plug one more product. But your Facebook page, your brother's Facebook page, has um, a product called Insights, which is the analytics for the page, and you can actually see what your demographics are, where these people are, if they're male or female, what their age is, and you know, what posts are resonating the most. So you should really be using those to, to kind of build the next, the next pieces out of that strategy. Can you say that? Oh, it's called Insights. So it's on, it's on your Facebook page. There's a link. It's on the right-hand side of the page. Here, you're welcome. OK. That was fun. Thank you so much. Wonderful panel.